Sorry, you don't you don't have to start again. But... I'm not going to start <laughs> again. Yeah. So I told all the secrets before the recording started. That was a really great proof of the Riemann hypothesis. Thanks. Uh, it was. It was. Um, but um, so you see the other property of curves of genus at least two is that they have a hyperbolic metric with constant negative curvature or they are uniformized by the unit disk. So these are the two properties. Let me see. These are the two properties that we are going to think about. So in particular, because they are uniformized by the unit disk, there are no non-constant maps from the complex numbers to X, right? Because any such map would have to factor through the universal cover and then, you know, by um, Louisville's theorem would have to be constant. All right, so then, you know, Lang in trying to generalize you know, the Mordell's uh, conjecture to higher dimension highlighted hyperbolicity. So you need to have some notion of hyperbolicity. And the notion of hyperbolicity that comes up is Kobayashi hyperbolicity. So, <clears throat> so what Kobayashi then is he defined the pseudometric that sort of satisfies Schwartz's lemma in general. So now how do you, in this uh, metric or pseudometric, how do you measure the distance between two points? Here is what you do. You take disks, right, with two points and put them in your, in your variety or in your manifold, right? And then you just take the hyperbolic distance um, between the two points, right? And then you sum them up. So you get some sort of distance and then you minimize this overall possible data in, in the picture, okay? Is that a quick question? Uh, yeah. uh, maybe not so quick. Are there any known cases of von Beery Lang outside Mordell Lang in the number field case? You've already given a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, so you need to answer this right now if you want. Well, I mean, I mean, not, like not not for like families of varieties, right? I mean. It's possible that you can write down a single equation and like play with the arithmetic and say that, oh, you cannot have any, right? You know, I mean, you can play games potentially, but like uh, not, you know, as far as I know, like, you know, other than curves and, you know, sub varieties of a billion varieties and things like this, we don't have general results. Right. <clears throat> but, you know, there are probably people who know this better than I do who can, uh, pipe in. Um, so you see, the reason is that the, the thing that you have to be careful about, the reason why I'm calling this thing a pseudometric is that in general, it's not a metric, right? So you see, the thing that can happen is that this distance can be zero. And for instance, the best example to see is if you have the complex plane, right? So now if you take two points P and Q, right, what you could do is you could take the unit disk and scale it Put it, put it in the disk of radius r, right? And as you make the radius r get larger, the points p and q and the unit disk get closer and closer together. So that you, like, you know, as you let r tend to infinity, the distances are arbitrarily close to each other. So when you take the infimum over all such things, you get zero. So that you see that this metric degenerates um, on something like the complex plane. So in particular, if you have a non-constant map, holomorphic map from C to X, right? Then the, point, the, the, the distance, the Kobayashi distance between two points in the image um, have to be zero so that X is not hyperbolic. I don't know whether I defined uh, what hyperbolicity means. So you, you, you say that X is hyperbolic if this, is, this defines really a metric, if the points the distance between the two points is positive if the points are distinct. All right, so in particular, what that says is that if X is hyperbolic, then you cannot have any non-constant maps from C. In particular, you cannot have any rational curves or any elliptic curves, or more generally, any abelian varieties in your variety. All right. And then, you know, there's a slightly different notion that's maybe um, a little bit easier to think of for us, and that's Brody hyperbolicity. And that says that every map, every, non every map from C into X is constant. So you call X Brody hyperbolic if there are no non-constant entire maps to your variety. 
So it turns out that for compact complex manifolds, these two notions coincide. Yeah. So for our purposes, the, you know, we're going to talk about smooth projective varieties. So there's no difference between these two notions. Um, and I should, but you know, you have to be careful in general, if you are working with complements and things like this, for arbitrary complex manifolds, these two notions are not the same. Um, you know, Kobayashi hyperbolicity does imply Brody hyperbolicity by what, by what I said, but the converse is false in general. It's just true for compact manifolds. Um, all right. So now, what are the Lang conjectures? So Lang made a sequence of conjectures and they go like this. So suppose that you have a variety of general type. Then there exists a proper algebraic set in there such that the images of non-constant maps from C lie in that proper set. So that's one conjecture. I mean, you know, some of these things are not just due to Lang alone. I should probably add like um, Green Griffiths, at least for one and things like this. I'll, um, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time on the history. So the second thing he conjectures is that images of non-constant maps from rational curves in the billion varieties lie in Z. And then the third thing is that the complement of this Z is hyperbolic. And finally, you know, if X is defined over a number field, then the K rational points in the complement of the Z is finite. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything about four. So I'll be more interested in the geometric questions about hyperbolicity. So the main point is that, it, and I'm not really going to say anything about hyperbolicity either. So you see that extremely hard hyperbolicity for any given variety. You need to, you know, get really lucky. Um, so then the may introduced sort of a tweaking of this notion that's algebraic. And then here is what algebraic hyperbolicity is. So you call a projective variety algebraically hyperbolic if there exists some epsilon, positive epsilon, such that for every curve in your variety, you know, twice the genus minus two is at least this epsilon times the degree. <clears throat> so notice that, um, for instance, this does say that your variety does not contain any rational or elliptic curve. This G here is the geometric genus, right? Because, you know, if the genus is, is zero or one, right? So then this part is zero or, you know, negative, but this part is always positive. So that you see that algebraic hyperbolicity, um, just like hyperbolicity rules out having rational or elliptic curves. Um, so Domain went on to prove that hyperbolicity does imply algebraic hyperbolicity and conjectured the converse for smooth projective varieties. As far as I know, this is completely open. <clears throat> but you know, the, the point here is that it's still pretty hard to check algebraic hyperbolicity, but that's more approachable. So the way you should think about it is that when you are checking hyperbolicity, there are two things, right? I mean, <clears throat> One is that, you know, if you have a map from, uh, from C into your variety, the first thing that you worry about is that this map, you know, the, the, the risky closure of the image of this map, for instance, can be dense a priori, right? So that kind of thing happens, for instance, for abelian varieties, right? So if I have a complex torus, right, this torus is just something like Cn modulo a lattice, right? And now you see the kind of thing that you can imagine is that if you have your lattice, right, then you can take a line with irrational slope, right, with respect to the lattice. And that thing can go all over the abelian variety and or the complex torus and this image can be dense. Um, so, you know, of course, Lang and Green Griffith, Griffith's, Green, uh, Green Griffith's conjectures say that like this couldn't happen if the variety was of general type, it's saying that the image, the closure, the Zariski closure of the image has to be a proper sub variety. But you know, that's not at all uh, clear. And in general, that's a hard work to, to show something like this, but there is a method to do it. Um, and then, you know, once you sort of, uh, you know, so, sort of say that, uh, you know, the maps from C to this have to be essentially algebraic, then you have to rule out, you know, algebraic sub varieties like rational curves or elliptic curves or whatever that could violate hyperbolicity. 
So what the maze algebraic hyperbolicity is doing, if you want to think about it this way, is that it's splitting the problem into two pieces and then you don't need to worry about the analytic part as much. You just need to worry about these curves. Okay. Um, okay. So, so let's talk a little bit about like some varieties where algebraic hyperbolicity is known. So um, <clears throat> I should say like, like, so for hypersurfaces in PN, there is essentially, for hypersurfaces in PN, there is a, a complete classification of when the very general hypersurface is algebraically hyperbolic. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So this uh, builds that builds on work of Ein, who was the first, I mean, you know, that was the first breakthrough when he proved that if you have a hypersurface of a large enough degree, then every subvariety is of general type. And he, he obtained some good bounds. And then later these things were all slightly improved by Clemens and Ron, Pachienz and Wazin. Um, it's of course not in uh, the historical order. I think it was Ein, Wazin, and Clemens run roughly at the same time, and then Pachienza. Um, and so, so with that, we understand the algebraic hyperbolicity of the very general hypersurface fairly well. I should also point out that the hyperbolicity of the very general hypersurface has also been studied, and you know, Sue de Mai and uh, you know many people have bounds, the bounds tend to be worse. It's worse than they expected, okay? <clears throat> but for algebraic hyperbolicity, it's pretty sharp. So first, let me tell you the theorem um, of Voisin Pacienza. So there it says that if you have a, you know, variety in PN and N is at least four, so you have a threefold or more, very general hypersurface of degree at least 2N minus two, then X is algebraically hyperbolic. And this is po the best possible because if you have a hypersurface of degree two n minus three or less, they always contain lines, so they can't possibly be algebraically hyperbolic. And then, um, and then you know the other thing that so then you can ask how about how about surfaces? And that was known by work of Gang Shu, who proved that at, when n equals three, then you know the genus, the geometric genus of any curve satisfies 2g minus 2 is bigger than or equal to d minus 5 times the degree of c. So in particular, if the degree is at least 6, right, x is algebraically hyperbolic. So then for a long time, you know, the, the hypersurface, the surfaces of degree 5 and p3 were like, you know, the annoying case that was left over. So, so Eric and I finally settled that case. So like, you, you know, the statement is a, an improvement on shoes genus bounds, which says, says the following thing. Suppose you have a very general surface of degree at least five, then the curve of degree dk, right, satisfies twice the genus minus two is at least dk times d minus five plus k. So in particular, you see the problem is that when d equals five, right, in shoes bounds, then this becomes zero and then you don't quite win. But now, of course, even if D equals five, here you get K. So, you know, epsilon one over five works now so that you get the algebraic hyperbolicity of the very general quintet. But, you know, why stop there? So once you, you can do it in P and then you can ask like what happens, um, you know, if you have, for instance, a very general surface and some other kind of threefold, can you tell that those are algebraically hyperbolic? And Hasse and Nelson sort of started this classification for toric threefolds. Again, let me not tell you every single example, but let me just pick one or two examples and tell you what the answer is, right? Um, so for instance, if you look at P1 cross P1 cross P1, right, then, you see the Picard group of this thing is gen of P1 cross P1 cross P1 is generated. So you have the projections, you have the three projections to various P1s and you can look, put, look at the pullback of O of one. So let's call these things H1, H2, H3. So, you know, any surface of course will have class A1, H1 plus A2, H2 plus A3, H3 for some non-negative A1, A2, A3 integers. So then the statement is that such a surface, a very general element of that linear series is going to be algebraically hyperbolic if and only if up to permutations, 
either all of these, all of the numbers are at least three, or if one number is two, then the others have to be at least four. Okay. And you know, you can, it's easy to see that this thing is sharp, right? Because I mean, you know, <clears throat> um, you know, if you have something like two, <clears throat> if you have a two, right? Then you can project this thing to one of the P1s. Then you have a one parameter family. You, you know, this surface is fibered by two, three cores, right? But two, three cores have genus two. And whenever you have a fibration, they have the tendency to acquire nodes. So once it acquires a node, then you will have something of genus one. And that's not so good for an algebraically hyperbolic thing. <clears throat> So maybe can I ask a question at this point? Uh, and that's why would you expect a formula in terms of the geometric genus rather than the arithmetic genus? Well, I mean, you know, the arithmetic genus is not that interesting, right? I mean, the arithmetic genus, you know. So the kind of question that you're asking is the following. Like, you know, suppose you have the surface and you have this curve, right? I mean, if this curve were smooth, there would be no question, right? But I don't know the Lefschetz theorem, right? Everything would be a, a, a complete intersection. But you know, you know the genus of a complete intersection. It's large. But the problem that you can run into is that what happens if the, this? What happens if the, you know you have a really bad singularity someplace? And then you know, the, once you normalize, the geometric genus will be much smaller than the arithmetic genus, and it's possible that you have a rational curve hiding in there. Or an elliptic curve hiding in there. Right. So yeah, so it's, it's, yeah. So it's really a question about how singular these things can yeah, be. It is really a question of how singular these things can be. <clears throat> okay. Um, and, <clears throat> but you know, that's a good question. I mean, you know, the key qu question here is the geometric genus. Um, and then, you know, you can do the same kind of thing, say, for instance, for P2 cross P1, for instance. Here again, you know, if you have a surface here, like you know, we have the two projections to P2 and P1, and you know, there are the two pullbacks of uh, of one from the two factors. <clears throat> yeah, I'm following here Eric's notation. I mean, for some reason here, I likes writing P2 cross P1 and not P1 cross P2, but so we'll have to stick with this, right? So H1 is the pullback um, of O of one from P2 and H2 is the pullback of one from P1, the class of that, right? So such a thing is algebraically hyperbolic if and only if again, either A is greater than or equal to four and B is greater than or equal to three or B is two and A is five. A, a is greater than or equal to five. Again, you know, you can see that, you know, if A were three, right, then you can have, you can slice the surface with, you, you know, a plane and you will get a cubic curve and that's the genus, that has genus one. So that's not good. And, um, <clears throat> you, you know, um, <clears throat> and the other thing that you can do is you can, uh, yeah, you so, so, yeah, or you can, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, so it's easy to see that the, these things are the best possible. Um, the hard part, of course, is saying that, you know, these are algebraically hyperbolic. A anyway, you can play this game for all sorts of toric threefolds. It's, it's, you know, you, you typically get sharp results. So let me explain a little bit how these kinds of things come about. So, so like, what's the strategy? Again, as I said, the strategy really goes back to Ein, and you know, with some improvements with Wazam, Pachians, and many other people. But the basic observation is pretty simple. Yeah. So, so suppose that you have a curve. I mean, so, so I'm taking a smooth curve mapping to your variety X, right? So then you see what you can do is you can pull back the tangent bundle of X. And then you see you have the normal bundle to the map. And then you see, if you look at the degree of the normal bundle, right? Then it's given by 2G minus 2 minus KX dot C, okay? So, so j just from the exact sequence. So you see, this is related to the degree of the curve. So this part we understand. So this is the geometric genus and it's given by the degree of this normal bundle. So the whole issue here is that you need to bound the degree of the normal bundle to this map. 
if I have a good lower bound on this degree, then I can win. Okay. But, you know, how are you going to do this? And the key idea is that you have to look at the universal family. Here, let me just talk about the case of P3, just to be concrete, but you know, you, you do the same thing in all the cases. So you look at the universal, universal hypersurface or universal hypersurface in this. Um, so, so, you know, what you do is you look, you, you know, you look at polynomials at degree, homogeneous polynomials at degree D. So, so, you know, you have your universal hypersurface. And now you see, suppose that you, do, you did have, you know, a curve of degree E and genus G contained in each such hypersurface. Then what you can do is you can, you know, you do some hocus pocus about et al base changes and, you know, taking appropriate finite covers and stuff. That, then you see what you can do is you can take a family after making appropriate changes. So you have a family of um, hypersurfaces and each one you have a curve. Okay, so now what you need to do is you need to understand, <clears throat> you need to understand this, this, this situation. And the point is that this normal bundle that we want to understand before turns out to basically being the normal bundle to this map H, this universal map H restricted to, to each the, or the general curve that you want to do. So in other words, if you want to understand the, this normal bundle and how negative it is, you turn it into a universal thing. Okay, so like there are relations among these things. In fact, the relation is pretty simple in this case. Okay, so now you want to understand this so that you see, you want to get the positivity from the positivity of the universal situation. But you see, you have some, um, um, all right, so, so now what you do is that, okay, so you have the vertical tangent bundle over P3 to this family of curves C and this family of hypersurfaces. So this gives you some sort of co-kernel. So what you can show is that this co-kernel bundle injects into this normal bundle and it has torsion co-kernel so that you get a bound in terms of first this one, the, this additional bundle, right? And then you see what happens is that now you want to control this bundle, this co-kernel. Now you see the nice thing about this is that we understand this, this tangent bundle really well. Right, because I mean, you know, this is the tangent bundle to the universal hypersurface of a P3. It's not a mystery, right? That, that can be understood in terms of Lazarsfeld Mukai bundles. And once you understand that bundle in terms Arshan, of. Arshan? Yeah. Could you explain <clears throat> in, a, in a couple sentences why K injects into NH with torsion co kernel? Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> Basically, where you, I mean, you need to check, I mean, you need to check, you need to chase some diagrams. Basically, you have the standard normal, normal sequence. Uh, I mean, you, you have, you have several sequences here, like that relate the tangent bundle to the normal bundle, and then you need to chase them. I mean, I don't know whether that's enlightening, but I can uh, show you the diagrams later, maybe. Maybe because <clears throat> you're somehow removing the tangent bundle of P3 from both sides, basically. And so, that's right. yeah, okay, all right. <clears throat> okay, so then you see, like you can understand this tangent bundle. I mean, this is in general over PN, right? Like in terms of these Lazarsfeld Mukai bundles. So like, you know, you have like, you have OPN of D here, so, you know, this gets a surjection from OPN tensor H, not of OPN of D, and the kernel of this is typically called the Lazarsfeld Mukai bundle, right? Like, you can basically identify the tangent bundle with the Lazarsfeld Mukai bundle. But you see, the trick here is that this is a hard bundle to work with, yeah? So, that, that's not like, you know, this is hard to understand, but you want to understand the positivity. So you see, if you want to understand the positivity, then the kind of game that you play is that you want to do it when you have M1, when this D is equal to one, right? So the kind of game that you need to play is that somehow you want to get surjections. You can't get, I mean, you know, M1 doesn't surject onto MD, but you know, if you take enough copies of it, 
you want to say that it eventually surjects into MD. And of course, M1 is nothing other than the cotangent bundle, right? So the, you have the cotangent bundle of PN. So you see the kind of game that, you know, was on place is like this. So this is- So, so what are in that, what's H and pi, what's, what is H and- uh... so, Okay, so let me explain. So you say, we save the universal thing, right? So the universal thing has a pi two and a pi one, and we have the eight. Okay, <clears throat> so, so you see, <clears throat> what you do, the kind of game that Wazan, Pacienza, and Clemens and Ron play is that they look at this cotangent bundle and they want to get somehow a surjection onto this K, possibly after you twist it by one. Maybe I should have twisted this thing by one, okay? Or, or maybe I don't twist it by one. This, this, sorry, this is the omega twisted by one, okay? So, so you see, in the, the kind of game that they play is that they show that, you know, eventually, like, you know, if you take this omega pn of one, pull back appropriately, it doesn't quite surject onto k, but if you take enough copies of it, then you can get a map that surjects onto k. And of course, the kind of game that then they have to play to get optimal bounds is that make s as small as possible. So that's the kind of game that you play. In this case, you know, you can, uh, it, but you know, in our case though, we are in good shape, right? Because you see, like in our case, we have a curve on the surface. So this K thing is rank one. So I don't have to worry too much, right? I already know that even if I take one, like if you take one copy, you can get a map to it. Maybe it doesn't surject, but it has to have torsion co-kernel because we are on a, surf a curve on the surface, yeah? <clears throat> All right, so then the kind of game that you need to play is that, okay, suppose that I have a map like this. So th basically you can think of this normal bundle as a quotient of this. Yeah, and now you need to do is that you need to bound the degree. But so then here is the next observation, right? Suppose that you have a quotient of this omega pn of one. Yeah, say that I have a, co a, a rank one, a line bundle quotient of this omega. Is that I got lost ago? You want to bound the degree of what again? I remember the, our game was always bounding the degree okay. of this nh, right? Right. And maybe let me put a T there because once universalized, then uh, you know this is just one fiber of this universal, right? So you see now the issue is that you want to bound. So you, so you have some quotient of of the cotangent bundle of P three pulled back appropriately, twisted put, twisted by one, pulled back appropriately, right? And you're asking how small can the degree of that quotient be? And the claim is that they can't be that small. So now, why is that? So here is the situation, right? Suppose that you have a line bundle quotient of, of you know, omega pn. Say you have a curve mapping to pn, generically injectively. Say that the degree of the curve is e. Suppose you have a line bundle quotient of this cotangent bundle twisted by one of some degree minus m, okay? Then the claim is that this gives as rise to a surface scroll of a given degree that you can control that has to contain the sort of curve. And I mean, basically this is not that hard, right? So you have the Euler sequence, right? So you have the Euler sequence for omega p for omega p n, you twist it by one, pull it back to the curve. So suppose that you have some quotient of this line bundle quotient. So then you see you get some sub here, but you know, composing this inclusion, you get this, and then here is your rank two quotient. Yeah, then this PQ prime maps into PN and that's your scroll. Yeah, and then you can control, you can compute the degree of this thing, yeah? Anyway, the, 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 the upshot of this thing is that, so now suppose you, you have this curve, right? And it's sitting in this hypersurface, it's in the surface of degree D and P3, D is at least five. But I know the left says, so of course, we know that the Picard rank of the surface is one, and whatever this curve is, it's a complete intersection. 
Yeah. So in particular, if there is a scroll that's containing this curve, right, then the degree is at least at least k. If this is a curve with degree dk. Yeah. Well, so then you just plug it all in, and then you see that you get, you know, the degree of this thing is at, at least k times minus dk by knowing the degree of the of the scroll then putting it all together we know what this degree has to be right so then you put it all together and you get your bound so th so that's how you can get uh, how you get the bound so uh, it, it seems like you only gain a tiny little bit right you Is gain the... a tiny little bit <laughs> i mean you need to how... gain that tiny little bit yeah i mean but how close is it to being kind of true or, or something I mean oh, that's a good question so let me give you some questions now now that you're asking so that's where so so, so you see the first thing that you observe right um, you know if you have a very general hypersurface in pn you can ask what are the possible general of curves so what this is saying is that there are gaps right I mean this like you know for instance look at surfaces in p3 right like, like you know this is saying that only certain genera can occur. I mean, the, the way it happens is that there are some gaps in the beginning, and once the degree is large enough, then all the genera can occur. But like in the beginning, there are some gaps. We don't understand the gaps. This thing is sharp, like initially. I think the best that you can do with, you know, for hyperplane sections is that you can have a tri tangent hyperplane so that the genus, you know, drops by three or something like from what it's supposed to be. So that part I think is sharp, but you've already for quadrics, I don't think we know it. Anyway, for instance, Chiliberto and company have thought about this problem in quite some detail. And you know, they did a lot of work for understanding the gaps for the quadrics. But I think past that, we don't know what the gaps are. But you know, you can ask this question very generally that you know, if you have a hypersurface at large enough degree in projector space very general, what are the possible general of curves that appear in there? So there's another question that you can ask. You, you know, this putting a K there is extremely crude. I mean, probably this thing is not contained in the scroll of degree K. Um, and so you can ask the question, suppose that you have a curve, just let's ask it in P3, but you can ask it more generally, I guess. So, so say that you have a curve in P3, um, on the surface of degree at least five, right? You know, find the scroll that contains the curve which has the smallest degree of the universal line in the Grassmannian, right? And you know, yeah, there's an obvious, I mean, I don't know whether this is an obvious case for the minimal, but there's an obvious scroll that you can take. Basically what you do is you'd look at your curve, you take the most singular point and you take the cone over that point, right? I mean, you can ask whether that's optimal. You know, if you could do something like this, it would have consequences for Sheshadri constants and things like this, because you, you know, you can get a bound on how singular that point can be from, from, the, from this kind of argument. Um, but, you know, I don't know that. Like, you know, there are similar results. For instance, like if you have a canonical curve, then, if the genus is large enough, right, th then there are, and the curve is general enough, then there are theorems that like, you know, if you have a surface of small degree, con like a surface of small degree cannot contain the curve. And then, you know, the best is like, if you take a cone over the curve of vertex a point, so it would have degree two G minus three. And if it's not that, you know, you can typically characterize what curve it has to be. Um, so, but, you know, I don't know a similar result here, but it would be very interesting to know what's like the smallest degree scroll that contains this curve. All right, so these are some. Could I add, could I add some other question to this list? I don't know if it's a good, I don't know if it's a good question, but what I wonder about this is um, if you do get a curve of high degree, which, which are the curves that show up? Like are they are they hyper elliptic? Do they have a lot of automorphisms? Like which which ones? Ah, so, so this is a good. 
question. So you are you are asking the following, if I understand correctly. So so like you know, that there's also the following folklore conjecture that you know, here is a bogus dimension count for you. This is one that Joe likes, so we should do it. So so you know, if you look at quintic surface, right? Those that contain a line is called dimension two. Those contain a line is called conic is called dimension three. Those that contain a twisted cubic is called dimension four. You know, by the time you come to a rational curve with degree 55, then you've run out of the space, right? So you can say that a quintic of, uh, you know, <laughs> the no smooth quintic contains a rational curve with degree 56 or something like that. A anyway, like you can ask the question whether, um, you know, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, for instance, like you can ask the question whether like, you know, smooth quintic surfaces that contain a rational curve, whether it's a, it's actually a proper sub variety or is it the countable union of sub varieties? I don't think we know that. It's one of those annoying questions. And I was I also like, sort of thinking about, about higher genus, like how do these curves lie inside the moduli space? Right. So, for instance, one thing that you can ask, I mean, you know, people have been asking this kind of thing, like, you know, you can, for instance, conjecture that, you know, if I have a very general quintic surface, right, then no curve is a double cover of another curve in there. I'm not sure that we know how to do that. I mean, I'm not... I mean, you know, it's one of these things that Johan tells you that if you conjecture, then you're willing to give your hand or arm away or something like that. So it's not one for which I'm willing to give an arm away. I'm happy to pose it as a question that you, know, you, can, you can ask. <clears throat> All right. So this is sort of checking um, when things are algebraic and hyperbolic, but you can also ask about what happens to length type conjecture, right? So, so Again, suppose that I have a hypersurface in PN, right? Then it's of general type if D is between bigger than that, like, uh. all right. So, so let me look at D between N plus one and two N minus two, okay? So then you see, like, we know that such hypersurfaces are general type, but they also contain lines. So they are not algebraically hyperbolic. So then you can, you know, in analogy with Lang's type, Lang type conjectures, you can ask, okay, like what happens? Like what are the images of rational curves or elliptic curves? Like what are the things that violate, um, you know, algebraic hyperbolicity? Like can we, can we find the union of the curves that violate this bound, okay? I mean, we know that there are curves that violate this bound because we have lines, right? So let's talk about the Lang locus a little bit. So in this hypersurface, let me let me associate it to this hypersurface. Let me give you a bunch of loci. The first thing I can say is that I can look at the locus swept out by lines. And that I'll call ZL in X. So this is the locus covered by lines. And the L is supposed to remind you that it's covered by lines. Then you see there can be points on the hypersurface where there is a line, a line of contact order D. So that you see that the line intersects the hypersurface only in one point. So then you see call Z1, the, the, the locus swept up by such points, okay? Z1 will be the locus swept up by such points. And you should remember that there exists a line at that point that intersects the hypersurface just in one point. That's how you remember what that means. And similarly, you can talk about Z2, and that's where, you know, it's the locus set swept up by pairs of points um, where, there, where the line between them meets the hypersurface only at those two points. And then, you know, you can, uh, of course, just talk about ZI where, you know, there exists a lot, like, you know, the set of points, there exists a line that intersects the hypersurface and at most I distinct points and so on and so forth. But, you know, for us, like, um, ZL, Z1, and Z2 are the most important things. So here is the situation. So say that you have X and PN, a very general hypersurface, 
of degree d. I guess I, I always said the degree d, but let me say it again here, yeah? degree d. So then you see the kind of question that you can ask is that, so here is the statement, suppose that your degree is sufficiently large and sufficiently large here means 3m plus 2 over 2, okay? Then the statement is that then any curve not lying in ZL satisfies twice the genus minus two is bigger than or equal to degree of C. So in other words, what this is saying is that for algebraic hyperbolicity, the Lang locus on such a hypersurface is precisely ZL because ZL is swept out by lines. So, you know, so, but on the other hand, if you have a curve that is not, does not contain in the ZL, then actually like, its geometric genus is pretty large, <clears throat> okay? For this, of course, the degree of the hypersurface has to be large enough. Um, so then if the degree is 3n over two, then x contains lines, but no other rational curves, okay? Um, now the third statement is maybe I'll have to explain this a little bit. So fix yourself some integer positive integer. Now look at, <clears throat> then the question is like this. So if you have a point on your hypersurface, then you can ask what other points are rationally equivalent to this point. Yeah. And then, you know, it could be that maybe you have a k-dimensional family of points that are rationally equivalent to that point. So what this is saying is that, um, suppose that you have k, which is a positive integer, and say that d is bigger than or equal to this number, 3n plus 1 minus k over 2. Then it says that the only points of x rationally equivalent to a k-dimensional family of points lie in this z1. Remember, z1 was the set of points swept out by, you know, lines that are, you know, <clears throat> that have contact order d at that point. And finally, um, you know, if you make D at least 3M plus 3 over 2, then, you know, if you have any point on X rationally equivalent to a different point on X, then that point has to lie in Z2. <clears throat> and that, that, that's, yeah, you know, so, so you can sort of think of like being uh, rationally equivalent to another point sort of, uh, you know, like having like a rational curve kind of uh, situation. And then, you know, you can also characterize when those kinds of things happen. All right, so let me maybe explain like just one idea about how you can approach this type of problem. Um, so the situation is like this. Here, here is the, it's based on some Grassmannian technique. So, so like suppose that you have a family in the Grassmannian of k minus one planes in Pn, okay? Now, if you have such a family, then you can talk about the containing family. And the containing family is the set of all k planes that contain a member of B, right? So you take the family, I mean, you take all k planes that contain a member of B and then a member of the family B, okay? So you see, Riedel and Yang sort of developed the technique to, um, to sort of translate certain questions of hyper, like, you know, the, the, I mean, may I should say a few words about how do you prove the hyperbolicity? The kind of game that you play is that, you know, you say something like, you know, on C, <clears throat> like, so basically what you need to do is you need to make algebraic differential equations that are satisfied by the C, by, by the map from your C to your variety, right? And the way you, you obstruct the existence of such a thing is that you need to find sections of various bundles, yeah, various jet bundles. <clears throat> so, so then, you know, proving hyperbolicity in the analytic setting basically has three steps, right? You need to first like construct enough jets to sort of say that they have, um, you know, they, they have some sections so that, you know, any family from C to this has to lie in the base locus. And then you need to keep cutting the base locus until it completely disappears. And in general, it's 
fairly hard to sort of going to go from having some sections to saying that you have enough sections just they don't vanish anywhere. Um, but sort of the, this Riedel Yang technique basically gets the difficulty in that kind of problem, meaning that you know if you have a statement, a reasonable statement, some reasonable property, and you'll see what kind of properties work, that works sort of for most point for the general point on a variety on a hypersurface then or a complete intersection, then it makes a true for a smaller dimension. It makes a true for every point on the smaller dimensional uh, complete intersection of that degree. So now how does this thing work? So let me explain this. And it, this is not enough to prove these kinds of theorems. You need to improve it. So, so here is what we want to do. So again, we are in the same situation. We have a family of K minus one planes, right? <clears throat> so that, and suppose that you have, um, and suppose that you look at the containing family, okay? So let me assume that the initial family that I started with has co-dimension at least two, okay? So then you see, I, you want to understand when the co-dimension of the containing family can be co-dimension of B minus one, right? So what you want to do, the kind of situation that you should think about is that you want to prove a statement for a hypersurface. You take a hypersurface in very large dimension, right? And say that you can prove some statement there. Then what I want to do is I want to slice this by linear sections, eventually to make a statement true for you know, maybe I can't prove the statement for every point or for every curve or whatever on the big hypersurface, but I can prove it at the general point. Then I want to slice this by linear sections until I make it in the sliced, uh, sliced hypersurface, like in, in this, you know, smaller dimensional sec linear section, this, it's true for every point. Okay. So then you see the kind of thing that you want to do is say that you have a good family, each time you slice it, Riedel and Yang tell you that the co-dimension of the bed locus increases by one. But I don't want it to increase by one, I want it to increase by two. So what I want to do is I want to characterize the families that for which it can increase by just one. So that you see here as the statement, suppose that you have the containing family has co-dimension exactly one less than the family that you started with then we can characterize those kinds of things. Then there exists an irreducible variety Z whose dimension is given by whatever, such that B, this family that you started with has to be all the K minus one planes that intersect Z. Okay? <clears throat> so for instance, like, you know, if this was, if the co-dimension here was N minus K plus one, what that would mean is that the only possible family for which this can work is the, the is k minus one planes that contain a point. If you had k minus one planes containing a point, then the containing would family would be k planes containing a point, and the co-dimension would go down exactly by one. Yeah, but that's the only case where it can happen. All right. More generally, of course, you want to do it you want to improve not just by two, you want to say that you improve by J. I don't know how to do this. So like, you know, you can call a family J clustered, right? If the co-dimension of the containing family is the co-dimension of the family minus J. I don't know how to geometrically characterize such families, but I can say that the cohomology, you can, you can determine the cohomology, you can put strong restrictions in the cohomology class and from that restriction, you get that the co-dimension is at most J times N minus K plus one. And in the case of equality, you can characterize the families. And that's basically the, the family B has to be K minus one dimensional linear spaces that contain a fixed PJ minus one. If you do that, then of course the co-dimension will go exactly down by J. But you know, in the intermediate cases, it's much more complicated. It's not so easy. In particular, the following naive conjectures, so the, the, naive, the naive statement is certainly false. Like it's not true that you have some family of PJ minus one planes and then these are the K minus one planes. 
that contain that family of PJ minus one pairs. It's much more complicated. <clears throat> All right, but the, but but when you want to understand exactly what happens, when does the co-dimension just drop by one? That one is not that bad. So it's precisely that. Then it has to be precisely the k minus one planes that that intersect the fixed variety of the appropriate dimension, and the dimensions, of course, to related to the co-dimension. All right. So then, how do you use this? You see, the idea, as I said, you start with a universal point at hypersurface degree and PN, and you have some property. <clears throat> and each time you pass to the hyperplane section, either the co-dimension improves by at least two, right? In which case, at some point, you get a nice bound, or lines explain the failure of the improvement. Remember, we are talking about the point at hypersurface here. So if you take a hyperplane section, like you know, and pass to one co-dimension less. There's some variety here that's explaining this. So these lines are explaining the failure. Yeah. Okay. So then you see what you what you end up with is that you know you either produce yourself some amount some lines with interesting geometric properties, or you know you've improved the co-dimension by at least two, and then you know by playing this game you win. So like for instance, like you know if you wanted to understand like how do you do these statements about having points rationally equivalent and so on and so forth? So, you know, what you do is you use Reutemann's theorem. So Reutemann says that a very general point on the Calabia variety is rationally equivalent to only finitely many points. So then you see, you can look at the universal, universal points at hypersurface. And in there, you look at this family of, you know, pairs of point and X such that P is rationally equivalent to at least one dimensional family of points. Well, what, by Reutemann's theorem, this is not all of URD, right? And then you play the game that, you know, if you pick past to like, you know, okay. So, so then you see the kind of game that's, so in other words, like BD minus one D in UD minus one D is greater than or equal to one. So then you see like the kind of games that you can play with either it happens that this BD minus CD in UD minus CD has now co-dimension at least two C plus one, or there are some lines around. I mean, then you have to fool around a little bit with the geometry of the lines to see whether, you know, they have to have contact order D or whatever it is that has to happen. But yeah, you know, at least that starts, you know, you can see how you can approach this kind of thing that's, you either get good dimension bounds or, you know, you find these lines. Um, I see that my time is up. So let me maybe stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's uh, unmute ourselves and thank you Zach, for a great talk. <clears throat> Are there more questions and comments for Zach? One question I have is how is this the end of the story is as far as you can push this? No, it's not the end of the story. I mean, I should have said that a lot of these things are totally sharp, of course. I mean, I think that in this case, it's possible to improve it. Let me see this case. In this case, it's possible to improve it by a half, potentially. By, sorry, by what? By a half. So, you know, it's uh, <laughs> if, uh, yeah. Um, but um, other than that, uh, like things are sharp here, but the way you can improve this, like the interesting thing would be here, that, like, you know, if you now make the degree a little bit smaller, then there is a range in which you expect conics and nothing else. I mean, lines and conics and nothing else. So it would be really nice to say that, you know, in that range, you know, the very general X contains lines and conics and nothing else. Then you know there is a little bit of range. Then you have twist the cubics, and in addition, you have twist the cubics and nothing else. And then you want to say that you get lines, conics, and twist the cubics, but nothing else. So that would be a really nice uh, way of extending. What would the order? I mean, it's all hypothetical, but you also expect there to be cubic plane curves, like low genus things will start to turn up as well. Like, what, what would you expect the sequence of things? Oh, what kinds of things you would expect to see? 
Oh, here, here we were mainly thinking about the rational curves. Yeah. So I'm talking Absolutely. about the rational curves, but you can play the same game, of course, with the other, you know, other genus things too, if you wanted to. I, I mean, well, we I, know I, less I, would, I would lose that game, so I guess that's, just, that's what ends the question. Um, no, I mean, you wouldn't lose that game, but um, um, I don't off the top of my head know the numbers. That's why I'm not. But, but you know, you could play the same game, uh, you know. <clears throat> I mean, you could play the same game with higher genus things as well if you wanted to. <clears throat> so, you know, like in this range, you know, um, what happens is that, you know, basically lines explain everything that happens. But, you know, if you lower the degree, then you don't expect lines to be the only source of trouble. The conics will start coming into the picture and uh, you're muted Ravi. I can't get from that point of view rational curves are all I mean it's rational not the higher genus curves don't really matter the rational curves should drive everything um yeah it's possible I don't know I mean you, you know from this perspective you already get the algebraic hyperbolicity like lines of account for everything but Yeah, but I worry that if you keep decreasing this thing, then it's possible that some genus one curves come into the picture too. <clears throat> okay. More, more questions or comments? Here's maybe a sort of dumb question. That's, uh, so obviously a lot of this doesn't work in positive characteristic for various reasons. Um, like for instance, this hyperbolic, like this Green Griffiths length thing, it's just completely wrong if you're if you're unirational or something. Yeah. But I was wondering, do you know if there is any literature where people do make some some conjectural statements, or is that just not a thing that anyone has ever done? I mean, actually, is it obvious that this thing doesn't work in uh, positive characteristic? I mean, the proof obviously doesn't work, but I mean, um, I mean, why well, put it into very general? Yeah, right, if you still say very general. So. Yeah, I mean, like you need very general, of course. Like you, I mean, it's, I mean, I guess it's not entirely clear that you need very general. There are questions that it could be that you could get away with general, but you can't say for all or something like that. So um, I don't know, Johan, do you know any examples of this kind of thing is violated and characteristic P? Uh, not, not, not right now. <laughs> <laughs> that seems an interesting, right, an interesting question. Uh, yeah. Which part of the proof failed in positive characteristic? Maybe if you put separable everywhere, then you right. I mean, if you put separable everywhere, maybe most of the thing can can go through. But I mean, you worry that some of these maps are not separable and things like that. Um, yeah, and I guess when you're dealing with universal families, it's it sometimes can be hard to guess when the maps you get there are separable because it might not be related to the thing you start. Yeah, I mean. <clears throat> But I mean, some of the positivity statements might still be true. I mean, those kinds of things, uh, you know, you know, whenever you're playing with just bundles, then you might be able to still get some of those positivity statements. <clears throat> more questions, more comments? Okay, if not, then let's thank Gazette again.